What's going on guys, this is Rob, and if you're enjoying the content here on my channel, then make sure you hit the like button, and make sure you hit subscribe so you can help decide what direction the content on my channel goes in, in the foreseeable future. Okay, so we're going to be a little bit dangerous here. We are going to, we're going to cover Secret Empire. <laughs> now I love, 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 love Secret Empire. I think it's one of the best written stories Marvel's had for quite some time. And I really love the way that it all comes together because to me, it tells this incredible story about the superheroes. One of the great things about Secret Empire is it shows how pivotal Captain America is to like the moral focal point of all the superheroes on earth, not just the United States, but all the superheroes on earth. I mean, you gotta keep in mind, Captain America has led a multitude of different groups. It's usually been the Avengers, but whether it's like a small group here and there, or whether it's like his secret Avengers, or whether he fights alongside other superheroes, a lot of people across the world look to Steve Rogers because of his leadership capabilities, because of the fact that he refuses to give up, he never gives in. But the whole point of Secret Empire is to give us a scenario where he turns the entire tables of everything that's happened on his head. Now, of course, we have all the lead up to Secret Empire from Captain America, Steve Rogers. We have part of Captain America, Sam Wilson, but uh, the comment section for a lot of those videos just turned into like racial, you know, arguments and bigotry. And so for the most part, I just stopped doing those videos. So you're welcome to catch up on those on your own. But the fact remains, that with uh, with Steve Rogers, remember, his entire history was basically modified. Steve Rogers, we knew, that was injected with the super soldier serum. He went on to become Captain America. You know, he was frozen in ice for 20, 30 years. He was eventually discovered by the Avengers, thought out, and he became the hero that we all know and love. It wasn't until all new, all different Marvel that we suddenly had uh, S.H.I.E.L.D. basically going through and grabbing all these different fragments of different cosmic cubes that existed over the years, piecing them all together, creating one cohesive cosmic cube that S.H.I.E.L.D. decided to create the, the whole concept of Pleasant Hill. And Pleasant Hill was basically using a cosmic cube to more or less warp reality and create this sort of idyllic prison that villains could be kept in with no idea that they were actually being held in this altered reality, so to speak. And so the result was that when Captain America Steve Rogers and the other Avengers learned about what was going on, it was a complete violation of the civil rights of all the different villains that existed out there. And so they basically broke into Pleasant Hill. They essentially brought the whole thing down, you know, at the same time, there was this big breakout that was initiated and it ultimately resulted in everything S.H.I.E.L.D. had done coming to light by way of Rick Jones, of course, one of the friends of the uh, original Incredible Hulk Bruce Banner, who had basically hacked everything, tipped the Avengers off, dumped the information out to the world, and uh, it resulted in S.H.I.E.L.D. really kind of getting a negative reputation or even worse of a reputation than it had before, but it brought the events of Pleasant Hill to light and it allowed the Avengers to bring it down. But in the middle of all that, we ended up finding out that this Cosmic Cube had become sentient, and it's always been that way. You know, the Cosmic Cubes always become sentient in Marvel comics. In some form or fashion, they end up becoming beings just because of the fact that they're just pure energy that will eventually take on an actual form. The Shaper of Worlds is a cosmic cube. Cubic, the original cosmic cube. But this one was basically composed of different fragments over the years. And because of the fact that the Red Skull had created and used his own cosmic cube somewhere along the line, this cube itself, when it became sentient because it was new, it was basically a child. And as a child, it recognized that one of its fragments had been used by the Red Skull somewhere along the line. And so it began to look at the Red Skull as somewhat of a father figure, and in turn, the Red Skull began to corrupt this sentient cosmic cube and used it to not only restore the youth of Captain America Steve Rogers, but to also modify his entire history to make him a Hydra agent. And so because of this, the Steve Rogers that exists now in all new, all different Marvel is a Hydra agent. That's really how all that came to be. Now, of course, again, we go more in depth into that as we go through our Captain America Steve Rogers stories, but in Secret Empire number zero, he had basically made his first strike and everything had been leading up to that point when he took out, when he killed the Red Skull when he recruited Baron Zemo to his cause. The whole idea was to bring everything crashing down. Now, the problem that writer Nick Spencer ran into was the idea of the Cosmic Cube itself. If the Cosmic Cube, going by the name Kobik, is the reason why Captain America is a Hydra agent, then all somebody has to do is capture her and try to force her or at least brainwash her into sending things back to rights. And so what he ended up doing was basically having the Cosmic Cube uh, more or less reformed and then eventually just broken into a thousand shards, broken into pieces all over the place by the Hydra scientist Eric Selvig, who of course had basically turncoated against Captain America. Now, of course, again, the reason for this was because of the fact that Eric Selvig had basically grown close to Kobik as a little girl, kind of viewing her as a surrogate daughter of sorts. And so the result is that where Captain America wanted to keep her prisoner, if not just sort of remove her away from everything, it resulted in Selvig just kind of dispersing her all across the Marvel Universe so that she could be reformed at some point along the line and her sentience would be restored. So instead of just allowing her to be a prisoner, she was kind of 
killed, so to speak. That's basically what happened to her character. And so what this story does is it sets the stage for tracking down all the pieces of the Cosmic Cube, or at least that's really what issue number one will do. What this immediate segment of the story does is show us how the heroes failed. Now, again, with Captain America launching his first strike, this came in a couple forms. Remember, Carol Danvers as Captain Marvel had been working on a shield that was designed for the purpose of basically protecting the Earth from exterior threats. Steve Rogers, after becoming director of S.H.I.E.L.D., fired Carol Danvers and then kept the S.H.I.E.L.D. project and then turned around and basically initiated this global S.H.I.E.L.D. to keep Carol Danvers and all these guys out. And the reason why was because of the fact that, remember, Captain America Steve Rogers had taken the queen of the Chitauri race, which exists very similar to termites or ants. And the idea was that they would constantly keep coming to try to locate their queen. By keeping the queen hidden on the planet Earth, it's essentially create an infinite wave of Chitauri forces that would continue to wear down the superheroes that were fighting outside of Earth and trying to keep the wave from penetrating the Earth before the shield went up. The issue was that after having Carol Danvers and all those super powerful beings outside Earth, uh, Captain America immediately initiated the shield, which kept them out. They couldn't get in. And all they were doing is just running into wave after wave after wave of Chitauri forces trying to arrive on Earth itself. Now that begs the question, why don't they just leave? Like, why don't they just go anywhere else? In truth, a lot of that's just for the sake of storytelling, just for the sake of showing us what it is that they're doing. But, you know, for whatever reason they don't, if for no other reason, then to just kind of keep the story going. But back on Earth proper, with the forces of Hydra basically launching their attack across the United States, specifically in New York and the Capitol by taking over the White House, this basically brings in all the superheroes. Now, on the whole, this is basically superheroes versus supervillains. That's really what it is. I mean, it was, you know, initially it was Hydra going to all these villains and saying, look, we know what S.H.I.E.L.D. did to you guys. Yes, you know, I'm technically the director of S.H.I.E.L.D., but we will make a better life for you. We will make a better world. All you have to do is fight on our behalf. And this was designed to be a ruse and a distraction. And the reason why is because remember, when it comes to the Earth's Mightiest Heroes, when it comes to the Avengers, being an Earth's Mightiest Hero doesn't necessarily mean the most powerful. It means being the Earth's Mightiest Hero in terms of your willingness to keep going, what you stand for, and your moral compass. And so the Avengers would just keep on fighting time and time again, and they wouldn't really worry about the idea of how powerful they were. They would just try to hold everything at check. But even then, there were still some pretty powerful beings here. The new Red Hulk is here. Vision, Scarlet Witch, Miles Morales, Spider-Man, the holographic Tony Stark, uh, Riri Williams, the new Iron Man, you know, I guess going by the name Ironheart, Hercules, Quicksilver, you know, the champions, the Avengers, the whole nine yards, it's everybody doing the best they can to stop the forces of Hydra. And the cool thing about this is we get this really interesting narrative along the way, and it actually comes from Black Widow, which I really feel like Black Widow is getting some of the best treatment in storytelling in this story that she has in quite some time, or at least for the first half of the story anyway. But the fact remains, Black Widow really kind of addresses all this and saying that, you know, as a person without any powers, but prodigious training in conflict and has consistently been part of like S.H.I.E.L.D. and the Avengers and the superhero community overall, one of the issues that the superhero community ran into was that much like, you know, the human body growing a resistance to various illnesses or to various cures, the superhero community began to basically develop an immunity or a resistance to the idea that they could lose, that they had constantly won against like overwhelming odds. You know, the scrolls would invade the planet Earth and the superheroes would win. Some villain would try to take over the entirety of the, of the world or the United States and the superheroes would win. They always came out on top that eventually a time came when they never thought that they could lose, that they could do no wrong. And that's the cool thing about this is because it's not like the heroes are full of hubris, right? It's not like, you know, it's not Casey at the bat. Well, they throw one ball, you know, and Casey's just kind of sitting there reading a newspaper and they throw another ball and Casey's goofing around and they throw the third ball and Casey strikes out. I mean, it's not them just kind of being arrogant or anything along those lines. It's just the idea that there's this aspect of their personality that they fought so many different villains. They just couldn't really consider themselves to be people who would lose. And that would make sense because think about it. Over the course of Marvel Comics publication history, even before the events of all new, all different Marvel, the first Civil War. Yeah, the superheroes lost, but Captain America died, he created a rallying point, and then we got the events of Dark Reign, one of the darkest eras in the history of the Marvel Universe when Norman Osborn took over Director of S.H.I.E.L.D. The superheroes came out on top when they exposed Norman Osborn as the guy that he was. The Skrulls invaded the planet Earth during the events of Secret Empire, creating all these doppelgangers of superheroes, and they came out on top. Thanos wielded the Infinity Gauntlet, the heroes came out on top. You know, all these stories, all these events that took place, the heroes 
always ended up winning. Yes, there were casualties, but they always won. And it's this idea of Nick Spencer sort of turning that on its head and saying, but what would happen if they didn't? What would happen if the heroes didn't win? Now, the question is how? Because Captain America by himself is incapable of defeating all these different superheroes. He just doesn't have the power to do so. And so what he did is he turned the heroes against each other. And this is designed to feed off the fallout from Civil War II. Because remember, Civil War II was Carol Danvers, you know, Captain Marvel going against Tony Stark, but it fragmented the entirety of the superhero community because it was basically violating people's rights. It was pre-crime. It was, well, they haven't committed a crime yet, but they will, so let's arrest them before they do. And so what ended up happening here is that people began taking up sides. They began saying, no, 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 I'm with Iron Man or I am with Carol Danvers, whatever the case may be. But because of the fact that this happened so soon after the events of Civil War II, there was no time for people to band together. There was no time for them to basically begin making amends for their own actions, put the past in the past and start moving forward. This was an immediate response with the Hydra inner circle, Captain America, Baron Zemo, Arnim Zola, Hive, Kraken and Madam Hydra all basically showing up on the scene. The fact that Captain America is a Hydra agent is a crushing blow to the superheroes because they now have to face the fact that the greatest hero among them is the one that's been working against them. And that's the craziest thing about this because remember, following the revelation or following the altering of reality by the Cosmic Cube and Captain America's past making him a Hydra agent, every single thing that he did, whether it was a story in Marvel Comics that was removed from the ongoing events and saw Captain America shaking the hand of Old Man Logan or whether it was something that tied directly into Captain America's own stories, he was always operating in the background. He was always working against the, the superheroes of the of the Marvel Universe. And so we always had to keep this in mind. Everything was moving towards the idea of him taking over the country. And that's why Civil War II was such a great story from the perspective of Captain America, because with Captain America being thrown into the mix, what it basically revealed was that he was the one the, that initiated the entire series of events. He's the one that set up the conflict between Carol Danvers and Iron Man. He's the one that goaded them into fighting one another. He's the reason why the entirety of Civil War II happened in a lot of different ways and why the the superhero community remained split. And so with them facing the fact the Captain America is the one against them, what we end up having are these series of events that aren't fully explained. They probably will be, you know, as the story goes on. But at the moment, one of the first things that happens is Jane Foster Thor is taken out. Because remember, Thor is one of the most powerful characters in the Marvel Universe. With her near invulnerability, with her hammer, her super strength, she's somebody who could easily just become a, a one-woman wrecking crew with regards to, like, the forces of Hydra. Just start, you know, tearing things apart. And so what ends up happening throughout this entire monologue, Black Widow continues to say things like, we fought because we were right but we fell because we were wrong. And so what ends up happening is Jane Foster is effectively made intangible by Vision, who's corrupted by the forces of Hydra. The Scarlet Witch is effectively taken over, although we don't really know how it is that that happened. And then ultimately, Captain America is able to reach down and pick up the Hammer of Thor. And that was one of the biggest moments in the entirety of this story. And the reason why is because of the fact that people looked at it and they immediately freaked. They were like, no, 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 no. It says only people who are worthy can lift the Hammer of Thor. How can Captain America pick it up. Well, they admitted how it was that Captain America could pick it up. The hammer enchantment does not say whosoever holds this hammer, if he be a good guy, shall possess the, the power of Thor. It says whosoever holds this hammer, if he be worthy, shall possess the power of Thor. And we know by virtue of the story with Odin's son, that the reason why he can't lift his own hammer is because he doesn't believe that he's worthy. Odin's son is worthy to pick up his hammer. He just doesn't believe he is. And so with Jane Foster effectively out of the equation, Captain America wrecks everybody in the superhero community, what's left of the event the whole nine yards and leaves them without any real moral compass. At this point, they're just a broken group and we'll find out how broken they are in Secret Empire number one. But with that being said, guys, we're going to go ahead and bring this video to an end. If you are new here to Comments Explained, make sure you guys hit the sub button to become part of the Rob Corps. If you guys enjoy this video, make sure you drop a like and I will catch you guys later. Peace.